think you're one of the most misunderstood people. I think we touched on it earlier, and I think that's why you and I got along, because it's our passion and competitiveness to win. So we out here cussing out refs or almost getting in fights, and people look at you as a a thug or a bad personality or someone you can't win with. Explain your passion for the game to people that don't know that just think you're a, like they thought I was, just an asshole. I was always the... I've always had older, like, homies or older, I was always around older, like, older guys. Mm -hmm. I'm playing with the teenagers, grown men. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have to do a little extra, you know what I'm saying? You you develop a different type of... Mm -hmm. You get better. You get better, but you got to come with a different type of aggression. You ain't just out there being Mm -hmm. cool. Right. So that's how I started playing ball. That's why I play with the aggression that I do play with. Mm -hmm. So with that being said, I love to win. I hate to lose more than I love to win. <laughs> mm-hmm. So if I feel like <laughs> in a way you affecting me winning this game, you in my way, bro, and I ain't feeling you. You know what I'm saying? It, yeah. You ejected that was then rescinded. What what happened there? I've never seen anything like that. It's ridiculous. It's obvious what's being done out here. It's on a nightly basis. I hope the world can see now what's really going on out here because it's getting ridiculous. It's really ridiculous. That was light, man. I know I know what their game scheme is every night. They're hyping up their big man over there. He thinks he's a stopper. It's not happening. I, I brought him back to reality. Recently in my free time, there's this book that I've been reading. It's called The 48 Laws of Power by Robert Greene. It's been a great read. And even though I don't necessarily agree with every law in the book, it gives great advice about how to gain leverage or power in various circumstances, whether that be in your career or your personal relationships. The only reason why I bring up this book is because one of the laws in this book I feel like perfectly encapsulates the reason why DeMarcus Cousins is not on the NBA roster today. The law five says, so much depends on your reputation, guard it with your life. Your reputation, especially when you're a public figure, is literally everything. The reality is we're all complex individuals with things that we do well and things that we struggle in. As humans, we often make assumptions about individuals based upon what we can see. What did people always see when DeMarcus Cousins was on the floor? They'll always see DeMarcus getting thrown out of games, leading the league in techs for multiple years, and having multiple dust-ups with players and coaches. With that being said, did DeMarcus deserve the reputation of being a hothead and unpredictable? In my opinion, yes, he did. At the same time, we can't overlook all the good that DeMarcus did for the communities and call him an outright bad person. Without ever meeting a guy, I truly believe that Boogie is a good dude and might have been a little misunderstood. At the same time, you have to have enough self-awareness about yourself and understand what the narrative is being said about you and make strides to change that narrative rather than just ignore it. In this video, we're going to take a look back at DeMarcus Cousins' career in the NBA and take a deeper look into why Boogie is no longer on the NBA roster. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. But other than that, this is what happened to DeMarcus Cousins. Not a place with a lot of opportunity forces you to kind of grow up faster than you want to. You know, I was a product of my environment. DeMarcus Amir Cousins was born August 13, 1990 in Mobile, Alabama. DeMarcus had five siblings, four sisters, and one brother named Jaleel who will also play professional basketball. When DeMarcus was born, his mother Monique was a single mother. This obviously was an ideal situation for the family to be in, with the single mom having to raise six kids all by herself. To make matters even worse, DeMarcus's environment wasn't a place well known for giving kids the opportunity to build a comfortable life. So you could say the odds were stacked against DeMarcus from the beginning. The one thing though that DeMarcus had going for him was his size. DeMarcus was always a big kid, with his mother being around 6'1 and his father being reported to be around 6'4. With the absence of the father figure in his life though, DeMarcus was at risk, like most young kids are today without fathers in the home, to go down the wrong path. What kept him from going down the wrong path though, was something that saved a lot of the other young kids from going down that road, and that was sports. DeMarcus always had great size and was a gifted athlete. Believe it or not though, DeMarcus' first love was not the game of basketball, it was reportedly football. DeMarcus standing around 6th, 6th, and 8th grade was playing quarterback. 
You would think that a six foot six DeMarcus Cousins would be dominating those kids on the football field, but in reality, he was getting beat up pretty good out there. The only way that an eighth grade kid was going to tackle a six foot six DeMarcus Cousins was going for his legs, leaving Mama Cousins out there worried in the stands that her baby was going to tear his ACL after every play. So she convinced him to give basketball a serious try. There were two major problems though. First, DeMarcus wasn't very good at basketball. He was big, but extremely raw and didn't have the best understanding of the game. The second problem was the AAU team DeMarcus was playing on, the Birmingham Storm, was a traveling team and they were playing in tournaments that ranged from Texas to Washington, D.C. This would force DeMarcus to spend a lot of nights away from his mother, which he did not like one bit. While at these tournaments, Cousins would struggle to make connections with the players around him, and he overall just wasn't having a good time. We all know that DeMarcus ended up making the NBA, so how did he go if he sucked so bad at basketball? He got to work. He was in the gym late most nights, working on his handles, his post game, his mid-range shot. He would call his AAU coach, Danny Pritchett, who worked him out every night that he would. DeMarcus just kept working, and slowly but surely, he was starting to get better. He began to gain more confidence not only in his game, but himself as a person. He began to open up and show more of his personality, always having a smile on his face, and everyone began to love being around this kid. By the time Cousins made it to high school, he was a serious issue on the basketball court. In his very first high school game as a 14-year-old kid, he would score 26 points, grab 15 rebounds, and dish out 10 assists. That wouldn't be the only triple-double Cousins would have his freshman season, he would actually go on to average one the rest of the year. Once DeMarcus started to produce on the court, bigger AAU programs began to pursue DeMarcus to come play with their programs over the summer. They would offer him anything that he wanted, shoes, cars, houses, money, literally anything. Despite all the attention and the persistence from these programs, Cousins stayed right where he was. Him and his AAU coach, Danny Pritchett, were starting to build a strong bond that no amount of money or attention could break up. DeMarcus also began to build a strong relationship with head coach of the Alabama Birmingham University basketball team, Mike Davis. The relationship was so strong that he actually ended up committing to UAB on February 28th, 2008, despite being the third best player in America. Despite his verbal commitment to UAB, the temptation to following Calipari to Kentucky was too much. He signed his letter of intent to Kentucky on April 15th. Cousins looking back would say that his days at Kentucky were the most fun he ever had playing in his entire career. Cousins would help lead the Wildcats to their first SEC title since 2004 with the overall record of 35-3. and Kentucky would make it all the way to the Elite Eight that year where they would unfortunately fall to a good West Virginia team. DeMarcus for the season would average 15 points per game along with just under 10 rebounds per game as well. Cousins was a man amongst boys in college. Some nights, it just wasn't even fair. He was just too big, too strong for some teams who just couldn't match up with him. He had a 7'6 wingspan which allowed him the ability to finish around the rim with ease when he was close to the basket. He had great ball skills for a big man being able to play make and showcasing great court vision. He even had a nice mid-range jumper and with the 7'6 wingspan it made his shot nearly unblockable. Me listing all these things Cousins had in his bag in college and you would think this dude would be the clear cut best player in this draft. But there was a big red flag that made most teams hesitate to pick him with the number one overall pick. The mental aspect of Cousins' game, to put it nicely, wasn't his strength. DeMarcus was viewed coming out of college as someone who was immature and someone who lost his composure really easily and very often. He made it the entire season at Kentucky without being ejected from a game. However, scouts still knew about his short temper and it affected his draft stock, no doubt about it. Despite that though, Cousins would still opt to leave after one season at Kentucky and he would be selected fifth overall by Sacramento. Cousins would spend seven years playing for the Kings franchise and the best record they would end up with would be a 33-49 and record his second to last season there. Yeah, that's pretty sad, but let me tell you something. That wasn't DeMarcus Cousins' fault. The best teammate that DeMarcus played with in his time in Sacramento was Rudy Gay. No disrespect to Rudy Gay, but DeMarcus seriously didn't even have a chance his first seven years in the league. To begin his career, Cousins would have a very rocky start, often finding himself in foul trouble most nights. And reportedly, he butted heads with the coaching staff on multiple occasions. It was also a big adjustment period for Cousins. He was recently on one of the best teams in the country in college, but now he was on one of the worst teams in the NBA. His overall game began to shift when he came into the league as well. This might have been due to him just having more freedom than he did playing with Calipari, but in college, Cousins only took 24 jump shots the entire year. When he entered the league, he would end up taking jumpers four times more frequently than he did in college. It wouldn't have been a big deal if he was good at jumpers, 
and they were good shots, but at that point in his career, he wasn't a very good shooter, and the shots were oftentimes forced, which would reflect in his field goal percentage to end the year. Cousins would show flashes of greatness some nights, though. There was clearly talent there, with him making the NBA All-Rookie first team at the end of the year. Cousins and head coach at the time, Paul Westfall, however, would not see eye to eye on multiple occasions. Cousins last year was being coached hard by one of the best coaches to ever do it in Calipari. And to go from that to Paul Westfall could be understandably frustrating. Paul didn't know how to get the most out of Cousins. It's no secret that Westfall's offense wasn't good. Plenty of players had spoke out at the time complaining about his coaching philosophy. But Cousins does deserve some of the blame in the partnership not working out. His body language on the court was some of the worst in the league. Cousins was simply just too emotional on the court. Despite DeMarcus's maturity concerns, he was a potential cornerstone player. Westfall wasn't a cornerstone coach by any means, so he was let go on January 5, 2012, being replaced by Keith Smart after starting the lockout short in year 2 and 5. They would finish the year with Keith Smart going 20 and 39. Heading into the 2012-2013 season, the Kings would decide to keep Keith Smart around as head coach. Despite the coaching change, DeMarcus's immaturity would continue to show up on multiple occasions. He just simply couldn't hide his emotions. He would lead the league this season in text with 16 of them, and he was ejected several times and suspended by both the league and the Kings. Despite the rocky season with Cousins, the Kings would still fork over $62 million to keep him around for another four years because, well, they had no choice. He was their only asset. After signing a four-year, $62 million deal, Cousins started to emerge as one of the best centers in his league, and he would emerge under his favorite coach by far in Mike Malone. He would average 22 points per game along with grabbing 11 rebounds, and even though the team would go 28-54, and 54, the team seemed to be heading in the right direction. The team would start the 2014-2015 season going 11-13, and 13, just one spot away from the 8th seed in the Western Conference. But on December 14, 2014, the Kings would ruin the Cousins experiment for good as they went on to fire Mike Malone without even letting the team know beforehand. This firing came out of absolutely nowhere. Mike did not deserve to get fired, no if, ands, or buts. He got the players on the Kings roster to buy into a coaching philosophy for the first time in a very long time. Cousins loved Mike Malone and for good reason. We see that he's one of the best coaches in the league today. The management for the Kings organization tried to justify the firing by claiming that they were overall dissatisfied with the job Mike Malone was doing, ranging from the style of play to the development of the team's young talent. We weren't behind the scenes 24-7, so we don't know everything Mike Malone was doing behind the scenes, but from the outside looking in, it looked like he was leading the team in the right direction. Tyrone Corbin would be the interim coach for 28 games before the Kings opted to hire legendary coach George Carl. Cousins and Carl had a very complicated relationship, not nearly the same relationship that he had with Mike Malone. At the end of the 2014-2015 season, George Carl and the Kings would finish the year going 11-19 in the final 30 games. During that offseason, Carl would attempt to trade Cousins, which he ultimately failed to pull off. Cousins would find out about Carl's plan to trade him away, and in June, around the summer league time, Cousins would tweet out a snake emoji, obviously not happy with the idea of his new head coach trying to get rid of him without even working a full season together. Their relationship would continue to be rocky throughout the entire season and killed any chance of Sacramento making a playoff berth. The experiment would go so badly this season that George Carl would be relieved of his duties just one year into the job. They opted to hire Dave Yeager, a promising coach, but by this time, DeMarcus was just sick of Sacramento, and in a way, Sacramento was just sick of DeMarcus as well. The constant technical fouls, the constant ejections, him not being able to get along with coaching staffs. Off the court, DeMarcus was an angel. He could almost do no wrong. He did plenty of things to improve the community. But in the workplace, he definitely had his days. And the more days that he had, the more the patience of GM Vladi Divac started to thin. This would ultimately lead up to the All-Star break, and on February 20th, 2017, the Kings decided to send their All-Star big man to the Pelicans. Cousins famously found out that he was being traded during a press conference during All-Star weekend when his agent would actually come up to him and whisper in his ear the news that he was no longer a Sacramento King. The Pelicans now had two generational talent bigs on their roster, and even though it was risky since Cousins was a free agent at the end of the year, he, they were confident that they could convince Cousins in the offseason that him and AD work and that they need to stay together for the long term. It wouldn't take long for Cousins to get acclimated to New Orleans either, with some nights it seeming like he should be the number one option instead of a prime Pelican AD. A little over a month after the trade, Cousins would have a game where he would put up 41 points and grab 17 rebounds. 
Not even 10 days later, he would have another game where he would score 37 points and grab 13 rebounds. Both games resulted in comfortable wins for New Orleans. The Markers would finish out the year playing good basketball with the Pelicans, but there was way too much ground to make up in order for New Orleans to have a realistic shot to sneak in as an 8 seed. The next season, however, midway through the year, the team would head into February with a 26-21 and record. Listen to some of the stat lines that Marcus Cousins were putting up during his best games this season. 41 and 23, 20 and 22, 40 and 22, 32 and 20, 44, 24 and 10. Like, bro, there were some nights where he was just simply taking over games. He was the clear best center in this league. And at this point, Pete DeMarcus Cousins was just simply special to watch. However, on the last day in January and the final seconds against the Houston Rockets, Cousins' career would never be the same. Late into the game with the Rockets, Cousins would tragically tear his Achilles tendon, ending his season. This was a crushing blow to a New Orleans Pelican team that was starting to get better the more games that they played together. But this was especially a crushing blow to Cousins' career. Considering this being his contract year, suffering a major injury like this would cost his man millions of dollars. Before the injury, Cousins was almost guaranteed to sign a max contract next season, but now the best offer he was getting was only a two-year $40 million offer from the Pelicans. You couldn't really blame Team Zell for not wanting to be all in on a center who is rehabbing from an Achilles injury, but at the same time, you had to feel for Cousins as well. Whether you like the man or not, he deserved that max contract. He just got hurt at the worst possible time. DeMarcus would decline the offer from the Pelicans and decided to sign a one-year deal with the Warriors for just $5.3 million. His thinking was he would bet on himself to come back and show teams around the league that he still had a whole lot more in the tank available by contributing to the super team's third straight title and maybe he could get a chance from another team at signing another max deal. He would have some nice moments in his time with the Warriors, but on April 16th, during the first round of the playoffs, Cousins was ruled out indefinitely after suffering a torn left quad in Game 2. He would eventually make his return in Game 1 of the NBA Finals, but his efforts wouldn't help the Warriors enough as they would end up losing the Finals in 6 games. After the series loss, he would end up opting to sign a 1 year deal with the LA Lakers, but in an all season pickup game, Cousins would tragically tear his ACL, forcing him to sit out the 2019-2020 season. If the torn Achilles didn't do it, this injury did it. Boogie would never be the same after this. He would attempt to make a comeback bouncing around a few different teams over a two year span, but it seemed like every stop that he made, there just wasn't enough room on the roster for him to consistently find minutes. He would have games every now and then where he would remind you of how dominant he used to be. Despite those glimpses of the former dominance, the opportunities simply just weren't offered to someone post their prime who had a reputation of being an unpredictable variable. You bring up DeMarcus, he was here just for a year. DeMarcus called me a month ago and he said, uh, he said, why am I not in the NBA? And I said, you want, you want that answer? Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah. I said, because people are afraid of how you're going to act. And he's like, why? I said, well, whatever the reason is, mm -hmm. it's here now. Mm -hmm. And, and I like DeMarcus, mm -hmm. like you guys may know him or not. Mm -hmm. Like he's just, I can't blame him for him because of all he's been through. Right. Like, like you said, the stability. Yeah, what eight, co seven, yeah, coaches and in like eight years. before all that, Matt. Oh yeah, just like, a life. Life. Yeah. Life. Mm -hmm. Like, who's to say? Mm -hmm. He is what he is. Fine. And I said, but here's the issue. I said you have to be better than everyone. Like, you have to act better. Like, to get back, you can't just be average. Like, mm -hmm. you gotta convince people, and that's not really fair. But that's the that's truth. just what it is. That's just what it is. Yeah. Like I could say, like maybe you two right. went through. Like uh -huh. it's like hey, I went through it with the ball. Yeah, right. Like you had to. You couldn't just act like a normal player. Mm -hmm. Now, now you're swimming upstream, and you're like, I'm not doing any worse. And they're like, But you did that. Yep. But you did that, and now you got to overcome that. And you're like, Okay, it's hard enough. You didn't know what to expect from Cousins whenever he was on the court. He played with emotion, which you love, but he never learned how to channel that emotion to the game and not cross that line. In April 2023, Cousins would decide to sign a contract with the Winabo Mets, a team a part of a pro league in Puerto Rico. So to answer the question, what happened to DeMarcus Cousins? Injuries significantly contributed to the downfall of DeMarcus Cousins' game. Before injuries, DeMarcus was unquestionably the best center in this league. 
Despite his talent, his image portrayed someone who is always angry and out of control, which caused NBA teams to hesitate on giving the big man a serious opportunity when it was clear his best years were behind him. You honestly can't tell me there isn't a place in this league for Boogie. But DeMarcus Cousins, who was as half as good as he was in his prime, is still an NBA player, a really good one too. Even though Cousins missed out on that last math contract, he still made over $90 million in his playing career. He has a wife and two kids and seems to be happy with the opportunity to continue to play the game that he loves. I wish him and his family nothing but peace and happiness. That's the end of the video. Let me know in the comment section what do you think about the Marcus Cousins? Should he still be on the NBA roster? If you enjoyed, please also make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. I hope all of my subscribers have a peaceful and happy holiday. Stay safe, everybody. It's your boy said, and I'm out. Peace.